I have an opportunity today to give two messages. And quite frankly, the way the two messages work out are the kind of style I like. In other words, a Bible study, we talked about the scriptures in the Old Testament about blowing of trumpets. There are lots of scriptures about that, so I could take the full 40 minute time to cover that. There are a lot, you'll see there are a lot less scriptures in the New Testament about blowing of trumpets, which means I'll keep this presentation shorter, which is what I like to do. I like the Bible studies to be fuller length. The sermons can be a little bit shorter, get to the point and, and, and cover it. So again, that's what we covered on the handout. It's the same handout. So if you're wondering where the second handout is, you'll see it's on the handout toward the end, page, the bottom of page three and page four, the blowing of trumpets in the New Testament. I, before I turn there to uh, the scriptures on the handout, I would like to turn to a scripture I overlooked. It's on the handout for the Bible study, but I did not read it. Jeremiah chapter 42. I'm going to read verse 14. But again, verses 13 through 16 really talk about the subject. Remember, we were talking about the, the blowing of trumpets. And I really like this, that scripture in Jeremiah. And I decide, even though I forgot to read it in the, in the Bible study point, I'm going to read this one Old Testament scripture concerning the blowing of trumpets. In the past, I've made the statement to you that I'm not always happy with the nation I live in or the decision of the nations I live in. I'm not always happy with the decisions of our judicial branch, our legislative branch, our executive branch. And I've even mentioned to you there was a time, because I don't think you want to be filled with bitterness always complaining. I don't think it's good to be always complaining. So I think it's like, if either if you don't like something, either try to fix it or move on. And I even considered, would I like to move anywhere else? I mean, I thought about that. Did I want to move to a different state? Did I want to move to a different country? I wasn't close to doing either of those things. The point is, I'm going to face it head on. It's like, okay, I'm not happy with this. What am I going to do about it? Either I'm going to make a change or I'm going to deal with it. That's my only two options. Make a change or deal with it. And I decided I don't want to move to a different country and I don't want to move to a different state. So I've got to deal with what is around us. Well, when I was going through the scriptures about, about the, uh, the trumpets in the Old Testament, I saw something interesting in Jeremiah chapter 42, verses 13 through 16. Because what it shows is some people back then wanted to move to Egypt to get away from trouble. Some of, the, some of the, the children of Israel, the children of Judah, wanted to get away from the trouble. So I thought, well, maybe we can get to Egypt and be better. So it'd be, it'd be like me saying, maybe Costa Rica would be better. Maybe Puerto Rico would be better. Uh, maybe uh, wherever. A European country would be better. Maybe Australia would be better. Maybe there's a way I can get away from the sounding of the trumpet. So what he says here in Jeremiah chapter 42, verses 13 through 16. But if you say, we will not dwell on this land, disobeying the work, the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, but we will go to the land of Egypt, when we shall see no, where we will, shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor be hungry for bread, there will be, there'll be no devil, you know, that's where we're going to dwell. In other words, he, they were saying, we've got to escape the trumpet sound. We've got to escape the bad points of the trumpet sound. And what the prophecy showed was, going to Egypt's not going to get you out of the trouble. Going to Egypt's not going to get you out of the situation where you can avoid the bad trumpet. Now, if you remember, if you were here for the Bible study, the trumpet sound could be something celebratory or it could be a, a severe warning. But this case, they were worried about the severe warning of the trumpet sound and you can't escape it. So you don't move to escape it. How, how do you deal with the trump? How do you deal with a bad trumpet sound? Well, not moving is the you're free to move. Anyone's free to move. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is our relationship with the Father and Son. Our relationship to trust in Him, that He will provide a place of safety for us, personal place of safety. That He will shield us like the wings of an eagle shielding us. That He will take care of us. And I would ask you, please, that you have that relationship with Him. That when the trumpets are sounding, that you trust in Him to protect you. Now, having neglected that in the Bible study and wanting to read it, 
you're going to see there aren't that many scriptures in the New Testament about the blowing of trumpets. I'd like to begin in Matthew chapter 24, verse, 4, verse 31. Now there are places where the word trumpets are used. An example of that is, do your alms quietly before men, because you don't want to be standing on the corner blowing a trumpet to draw attention to yourself. I'm not quoting those verses. Those verses are making an analogy, and that's not the main point. But notice this, Matthew 24, verse 31. Notice this about the trumpet sound. Let's read it for what it says, okay? Sometimes when you read it for what it says, you're sometimes a little surprised that you're reading it differently than what you thought it said, or a little differently than your church said it said. What does it really say? And I'm reading from the New King James, Matthew 24, verse 31. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So he's gonna gather his elect, which if we were gonna take the English words more literally, would mean that they're all not in one place, that they are scattered. And again, it, actually where they're scattered is from one heaven to the others. So again, the, the, the people of God are going to hear this trumpet sound, and this trumpet sound is going to be a, a very good thing. So what we talked about in the Old Testament, how the trumpet sound could be good or bad. It can be a warning, an alarm, or it could be a celebration. Here it's talking about when you hear this trumpet sound, and there are going to be bad things preceding this trumpet sound. But the trumpet sound, and what I hope we'll focus on on the, on the Feast of Trumpets, is the good messages of trumpets the good messages of God's promises, the good messages of what he has in store for us. He'll gather elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So that's what it says. I'm not implying that people are necessarily going to heaven when they die. I'm, I'm, I'm saying here as I'm reading the verse that there, for, there are going to be people scattered, it says, in the heavens, and they're going to be pulled together. So again, we can, you have to look at other scriptures to flesh that out and fill that out. But I'm just looking at the verse that talks about trumpets. That trumpet sound's gonna be great. And when the trumpet sound comes, people are gonna be pulled together in a way that they may not even have the opportunity to be together before that. Let's look at another one, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 and 19. It continues on to verse 24 where it talks again about the trumpet. Now we're reading in the book of Hebrews, and by the way, I was incorrect. I, th I thought we were gonna be reading from Hebrews 9, but it was Hebrews 8 when I made the comment that we'd be reading about the ark in, in the re scripture reading. That comes tomorrow or next week, depending what scripture reading we have on Monday. But here we are in Hebrews 12, again, showing the beauty of God's precious truth from the Old Testament, how it's filtered and seen through the New Covenant, through the New Testament. The beauty, the reliability that we look upon, but also apply it from a different point of view. So I'm not looking to go backwards to try to do things like we're done as an Old Testament style. I don't want to have to stone people for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. That has no interest to me at all. I want nothing to do with that. God's not requiring that. But that was an instruction in the book of Exodus or Numbers. And so the, the point I'm saying to you is we want to look to God's truth, but we want to look to it through the filter of the beauty of the New Testament. And that's what we strive to do as the Church of God, Big Sandy. That's what we're hoping to do. For you have, no, you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire. You've not come to the blackness and darkness and the tempest. You've not come to the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so those who heard it begged for that the world, the word should not be spoken to them. See, I remember that. Some of you are thinking, I remember that was from the book of Exodus. That's from the book of Exodus chapter 19. I remember that. And you're right. He's saying that when you think of that history, when you look back to that history of what was done back then, it's not exactly the same thing. When they heard the trumpet sound, they were scared to death. They were quivering, they were, they were quaking. 
That was the history we see in Exodus 19. He says, that's not the relationship that God has with you today. Now, some people want to do it that way. Some people try to foster that kind of relationship. I would recommend that you not. I would recommend that you would not foster that approach, that reaction to the way of God, to the law of God, to the love of God, to the mercy of God. Then he goes on to quote scriptures from Exodus 19, scriptures from Deuteronomy 9. That's what he quotes, taking it back to learning from the Old Testament accounts, learning from the history, learning from what was there. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. So again, when you tell people that you observe the feast days and when you go to a feast of tabernacles, and I caution you every year about this at the feast, I will caution you again. When people ask you, why do you keep the feast of tabernacles? If you just blanketly say Leviticus 23, you're going to give the wrong impression. Because Leviticus 23 is full of animal sacrifices and offerings and paying vows. So you can, you, you know, in other words, if you, you just say that quickly and just think, well, that solves everything, you probably have just confused your family member or friend or teacher thinking, are you, are you claiming to do the animal sacrifices? Yes, Leviticus 23 lists what we do. So again, it's part of the discussion. But if you do, if you just quickly mention that, and if they think you're under the old covenant, you know, you're sending the wrong impression. Now, you may not care, but you know, I, I care about myself and I actually care about you. Things I put in the bulletin, I care about you. I care how the people who read our bulletin view this congregation. Yeah, and then we want, it was when I did a April and Graham's uh, wedding and I sat down with the, the Roberts, uh, who's Graham's father. And I, I and mother, I sat down, uh, sat down with the Roberts, and I apologized to them, because again I was had the privilege of participating in their wedding, and so I apologized to them. I said, I'm sorry for the way the institution over to the east looked down their nose at the community. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about the way many, not not all, I can't speak, not everyone made the mistake. But I said I apologize to you for the way people viewed the community and maybe yourself. And their answer was, oh, we know what you think. I said, oh, you do? Yes, we, we, I said, we know what you think. We know that you like a lot of the teachings of the old church of God, but you don't like the approach of the old church of God. You don't like the, you don't like the government style of the old church of God. You don't like the condescension of the old church of God. And you don't like to be cramming these things down people's throats. And I thought, wow, I said, I wish every man in the church of God had figured me out as well as they did. And I even asked them, I said, by the way, uh, how did you come upon this? And they said, well, we read the journal. So they read Dixon and Linda's paper. I don't know how many times they read it. I don't know where they got it. But they would, re they would read my articles in the journal and they had me figured out, even when many people in the church of God can't figure it out. But they knew, they said, you like, like you like the Sabbath, that you like these things, but your approach toward the Sabbath is different. Well, that's true because I like a lot of the teaching of the Old Testament, but I like to have a new covenant approach, a, a New Testament approach. And I think that's what we do. We, we, we gravitate, hold on to really good things, but we, like to have a, we don't like to have a condescending or judgmental approach for people who do things. And we try to have a more loving approach. That's what we try to do. But you see, we're coming to the city of the living God. We come before the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, I don't experience the heavenly Jerusalem physically, but again, I, I do have a relationship with the Father, as do you. And we, in our prayer life, we approach these beautiful truths like the book of Hebrews says. And I'm so glad the book of Hebrews is in the canon because it really helps to, again, it, it talks about the good things from the Old Testament, but shows a right way to look at it, which I really love the fact that it does that. But he says, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable co company of angels, innumerable, excuse me, to the general assembly, to the church of the, of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, and I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I, don't, I won't ignore it, because if you list the things it says to, there's about four or five things that says you've been called to this, to that, to this, to that, and again, we, don't, we never run from the Bible. We're never afraid of the Bible. 
But we're called to God, the judge of all. We're called to these spirits of just men made perfect. We're called to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. We're called to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than the blood of Abel. But again, the point is, when we observe what we observe, when we do what we do, we certainly learn about a lot of it from the Old Testament. But then we also keep it in a way that we feel is in accordance with the Father and the Son. And so again, we, we do it because we love doing it. We think it's a great thing to do. We think it's a valuable thing to do. We think it's important for us to do it. But we want to do it in a more mature and loving way. Really, if, if, you, if we analyze it, if we would do the good things we do and have a lot more love and consideration for other people, they may still not accept what we do. And you, you and I don't let people talk us out of doing something we feel is important to do. But on the other hand, I find that if I have a better approach in dealing with people, they're not trying to talk me out of it. And sometimes, <laughs> excuse me, sometimes they even ask a question of interest. They're like, why do you do that? And if they ask you that question, it gives you a chance to reflect a way of light. <laughs> but again, this has all come from the point where it says, we're not scared of the, the sound of the trumpet. That's how this ties in. I could have stopped at verse 19 that just talked about the sound of the trumpet. But I wanted to read it in this context that the sound of the trumpet, I hope you're not scared of, of God. I hope you're not terrified of God. I hope you don't view God's teachings as something that's cumbersome. Yes, I know some, some crosses are heavy to bear. We're not minimizing that. But the point is we have to realize what is heavy and what is not heavy. We don't want to make things heavier than they have to be. We want to accept what truly is heavy. and not. We don't want man-made traditions or man-made opinions to be heavy on us when we have to deal with real serious trials, important trials, health trials, or whatever. Anyway, the reason I quoted Hebrews 12, the only reason it came up is in verse 19, it talked about the trumpets, the trumpets of God, and I wanted to read it in this context. Now, in Revelation, I'm not going to read all these in Revelation, but in Revelation 1, verse 10, it talked about that John heard the words of the, of the vision like a voice of a trumpet. In Revelation 4, 1, again, he mentioned again that what he read in Revelation, what he heard in Revelation and what he wrote down, he heard like a voice of a trumpet. He actually heard the sound. Then we have in Hebrews 8 and 9 and 11, we hear it mentioned that the seven angels having seven trumpet sounds. And so the first angel sounded the trumpet. And what did that mean? The second angel sounded the trumpet. And what did that mean? Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. I would like to read Revelation eleven fifteen. Revelation eleven fifteen, which to me is a, one of the most positive verses in all the Bible. Because if you remember, we talked in the Old Testament time, the trumpet sound was negative and positive, depending on the purpose it needed to do. Well, that could be true about these things. In this section of Revelation, when it mentions what all these angels sounded, when they sounded their trumpet, it usually was bad news. And it was, it, you know, there were, actually the last three trumpets are called the three woes. They were bad news. Now someone can say, well, David, it doesn't sound like you're going to be going through and going over the, the bad news. No, I'm not. You, first of all, you can read it. You've read it before. But I, I'm not wanting to focus on the bad news. I want us to be aware of the bad news. I want us to be aware of the warnings, but I don't want to be focusing on it because I don't believe in a fear religion where you have people quivering, quaking in their boots about what's going on around us. I love the seventh angel sounding. My favorite one, of course. It's, it's very positive. Revelation eleven fifteen. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Of course, you can think of the, you can hear the Alleluia chorus refrain as, that, as that those words are put to beautiful music. The world finally comes to the, the kingdom of God. These, these kingdoms here, which are God allows, but God is not behind all these actions of these kingdoms. You know, we can't blame God for the mistakes of human leaders. We can't blame God for the mistakes of human systems. We realize what they are, and, and unfortunately, we they see too much humanity in these systems and too much humanity in these people. We do like the fact that anytime God seems to intervene or goodness intervenes, 
and good things happen. We thank God for the goodness that happens and occurs. And we, at, we keep praying for that to continue to occur, and we appreciate it for occurring. But I can't wait for the seventh trump. The seventh trump. Yes, there's going to be bad news le leading up to it. And maybe, maybe on Monday you'll hear a little bit of the bad news leading up to it. But I suspect, I know I'm giving the study, and I suspect when is not going to be beating you over the head with the bad news of it. It's there. You can read it for yourself. You can read the facts. You can read the statistics. You can read all of it. But again, we want to focus on the kingdom of God coming to this earth. The kingdom of God is what we're looking for. I want to read two sections of scripture in conclusion. It'll take me a while to read them, but yeah, I'm, I'm headed that way. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 54. Again, it doesn't say much about the talk of, of trumpets. Well, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about speaking in tongues. It can be like a trumpet sound or a tinkling cymbal. It can be talk, talks about that over there. But here in 1 Corinthians 15, let's read the verses about trumpets here. Verses 51 through 54. I'm going to start verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must not put on incorruption, and this mortal must not put on immortality. So again, that trumpet sound, which we talk about, and I know some people like to talk about, is the return of Christ have to do with the day of Pentecost or the Feast of Trumpets? And one thing, one of the things I find really crazy is to even argue about it. I'm, I'm going to focus on Christ returning. And if Christ, if Christ returns on the picture by the day of Pentecost and the, that, all that time there picks a purification or whatever on the, the sea of glass and whatever different people say, those are nice theories. Those are, I mean, that's what they are, is theories, by the way. They're only theories. If someone tells you those things dogmatically, they're overstepping their bounds. They're nice theories. They're interesting theories. Might make a nice interactive Bible study sometime. But the point is, we're, we're, we'd be quibbling about timing anyway. And why would anyone want to quibble about the, something like that when we should be practicing love? You know, practicing consideration. Practicing how to deal with people. That's the more important thing. But I know some type people argue about that. And maybe, maybe you, don't, you don't even know about the difference. But that's okay, because I'm glad you're not an arguer. I'm glad you don't get consumed with those things. But again, whenever you think the, the trumpet is, and I'm, I'm focusing on the Feast of Trumpets, the sound of a trumpet, I look forward to a time when a wonderful thing will happen. A wonderful thing will happen. And verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. What a beautiful thing. I want to conclude in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, Verses 13 through 18. By the way, this is, if I, a lot of times I'll only read one verse at a funeral. And this is the one I oftentimes read. I don't read this every time, but I read it the greatest majority of the time at a funeral. Because I don't preach long funerals. I try to plant some seeds at a funeral. I try to talk about the person a lot. I've, I've been to funerals, I've been to Catholic funerals where people take communion. That's their business. I've been to Baptist funerals where they do altar calls. That's their business. And I've been to Church of God funerals where the preacher gets up there and preaches for 45 minutes to try to cram scripture down someone's throat. That's their business. Our approach is to talk about the person. To have it, I try to have as many eulogies as possible because the more voices that go, the better. The more voices at a funeral, the faster it goes, the better. So we don't want long stories. We like short stories. Look, good things said. Boom, 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 boom. A lot of positive things said. That's what we, that's what we shoot for. And then at the end, uh, I may talk for three minutes or five minutes. That's all I may talk. Plant some seeds at the end and let God give the increase. 
If he wants, if he wants someone to have the conclusion, draw the conclusions that I'm expressing, that's great. If not, I'm not worried about it. I don't, I don't have to be cramming any information down anyone's throat. And usually at a funeral, what I say is, this is what the person believed. And so they'll, they'll give me five, 10 minutes of that anyway, because they, first of all, they probably know what their loved one believed. And if they don't, they'll find it interesting to hear about it for a short period of time, because our, short, our attention spans are really short anyway. But this is a verse I oftentimes read at a funeral. So don't be surprised if you go, the next 50 funerals you hear me do that I'm reading this verse most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time. Chapter 4, Thessalonians, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you should sorrow as others who have no hope. And again, so it's, it's very common to sorrow, to mourn when we lose something valuable, especially when either the person's younger or the accident is quickly. When someone is on their deathbed or going through hospice, a lot of times you, you don't mourn quite the same way because you're actually sometimes praying that the person passes because they're suffering so much, you want the suffering to end. So again, the way a person dies and the circumstances of how a person dies can affect how a person feels about it. But we lose, we mourn over things. Even those who don't have great relationship with their parents still do mourning. Sometimes they're mourning for their lost youth. Sometimes they're mourning for whatever. But if you really love somebody, well, there could be a heavy, heavy mourning going on. But the thing is, what Paul's saying is, mix your mourning with hope. And he would talk about the hope of the resurrection. That we would want to mix our mourning with hope. But again, it's, it's, you don't want to ignore it. You don't want to run from your mourning. If you try to run from your mourning, you're just delaying it. So you don't want to run from it. You may want to embrace it privately or around close friends. You may not want to mourn in front of everybody. I mean, it's not the end of the world if you do. But most people don't want to do that. Most people want to mourn privately or either by themselves in prayer, which that's my favorite place to mourn, is in prayer privately. Or you can mourn around people, as, as Neil was talking about, the three different types of people that T.D. Jakes brought out, your confidants. There are people you don't mind mourning around because they're just part of you. Hopefully it's your family, but if you don't have that relationship with your family, you can have that relationship with other people that have grown through the years. You can have that relationship where you can mourn with them. But whenever we truly mourn, we can mourn with hope. And the, to me, the seventh trumpet is a time of hope. I don't focus on all the killings. I know it's, a, I'm aware of it, I, I read it. I know I can sometimes even quote it. Although, since I'm not reading it as often, I can't quote it specifically as I used to. But I like to focus more on the hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even as God will bring with him those who sleep with Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the, air, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So to me, the seventh trump pictures a resurrection pictures a time of being changed, the change that needs to be done. We can do the best we can physically, but there needs to be a change that we cannot complete. And that's why, it's, that's why we trust in God. That's why we look to Him. That's why we build a relationship with Him. We do the things we're supposed to do, and we trust in God to make the final transition for us. So, uh, brethren, when you think about the, the day of trumpets, I gave, I gave you earlier a lot of scriptures you can look at about the Old Testament. Those are healthy. Those are valuable. Those are beneficial. But I want you to focus on these, especially 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. And if you think about these in a positive way, I think your Feast of Trumpets can be very enjoyable in a couple of days. And the last thing Paul wrote in that, in that letter, in that chapter is, comfort one another with these words. So brethren, please comfort one another with the truth about the trumpet sound. The trumpet sound that can bring in bad news, but the trumpet sound that will bring in beautiful news for us for the rest of our lives for eternity.